Life on the Mississippi, Chapter 42. Chapter 42. Hygiene and Sentiment. They bury the dead in vaults, above the ground. These vaults have a resemblance to houses sometimes to temples, are built of marble, generally, are architecturally graceful and shapely. They face the walks and driveways of the cemetery. And when one moves through the midst of a thousand or so of them and sees their white roofs and gables stretching into the distance on every hand, the phrase, City of the Dead, has all at once a meaning to him. Many of the cemeteries are beautiful, and are kept in perfect order. When one goes from the levee or the business streets near it, to a cemetery, he observes to himself that if those people down there would live as neatly while they are alive as they do after they are dead, they would find many advantages in it. And besides, the quarter would be the wonder and admiration of the business world. Fresh flowers, in vases of water, are to be seen at the portals of many of the vaults, placed there by the pious hands of bereaved parents and children, husbands and wives, and renewed daily. A milder form of sorrow finds its inexpensive and lasting remembrancer in the coarse and ugly but indestructible immortal, which is a wreath or cross or some such emblem, made of rosettes of black linen, with sometimes a yellow rosette at the conjunction of the cross's bars kind of sorrowful breast pin, so to say. The immortal requires no attention. You just hang it up, and there you are, just leave it alone, it will take care of your grief for you, and keep it in mind better than you can. Stands weather first rate, and lasts like boiler iron. On sunny days, pretty little chameleons gracefulest of legged reptiles creep along the marble fronts of the vaults, and catch flies. Their changes of color as to variety. Are not up to the creature's reputation. They change color when a person comes along and hangs up an immortal, but that is nothing, any right-feeling reptile would do that. I will gradually drop this subject of graveyards. I have been trying all I could to get down to the sentimental part of it, but I cannot accomplish it. I think there is no genuinely sentimental part to it. It is all grotesque, ghastly, horrible. Graveyards may have been justifiable in the bygone ages, when nobody knew that for every dead body put into the ground, to glut the earth and the plant roots, and the air with disease germs, five or fifty, or maybe a hundred persons must die before their proper time. But they are hardly justifiable now, when even the children know that a dead saint enters upon a century-long career of assassination the moment the earth closes over his corpse. It is a grim sort of a thought. The relics of Saint Anne, up in Canada, have now, after 1900 years, gone to curing the sick by the dozen. But it is merest matter of course that these same relics, within a generation after Saint Anne's death and burial, made several thousand people sick. Therefore these miracle performances are simply compensation, nothing more. Saint Anne is somewhat slow pay, for a saint, it is true. But better a debt paid after 1900 years, and outlawed by the statute of limitations, than not paid at all, and most of the knights of the halo do not pay at all. Where you find one that pays like Saint Anne you find 150 that take the benefit of the statute. And none of them pay any more than the principal of what they owe. They pay none of the interest either simple or compound. A saint can never quite return the principal, however, for his dead body kills people, whereas his relics heal only. They never restore the dead to life. That part of the account is always left unsettled. Dr. F. Julius Lemoyne, after 50 years of medical practice, wrote. The inhumation of human bodies, dead from infectious diseases, results in constantly loading the atmosphere, and polluting the waters, with not only the germs that rise from simply putrefaction, but also with the specific germs of the diseases from which death resulted. The gases from buried corpses will rise to the surface through 8 or 10 feet of gravel, just as coal gas will do, and there is practically no limit to the power of escape. During the epidemic in New Orleans in 1853, Dr. E. H. Barton reported that in the 4th district the mortality was 452 per thousand more than double that of any other. In this district were three large cemeteries, in which during the previous year more than 3,000 bodies had been buried. In other districts the proximity of cemeteries seemed to aggravate the disease. In 1828 Professor Bianchi demonstrated how the fearful reappearance of the plague at Modena was caused by excavations in ground where, 300 years previously, the victims of the pestilence had been buried. Mr. Cooper, in explaining the causes of some epidemics, remarks that the opening of the plague burial grounds at Eme resulted in an immediate outbreak of disease. North American Review, No. 3, Volume 135. 
In an address before the Chicago Medical Society, in advocacy of cremation, Dr. Charles W. Purdy made some striking comparisons to show what a burden is laid upon society by the burial of the dead. One and one fourth times more money is expended annually in funerals in the United States than the government expends for public school purposes. Funerals cost this country in 1880 enough money to pay the liabilities of all the commercial failures in the United States during the same year, and give each bankrupt a capital of $8,630 with which to resume business. Funerals cost annually more money than the value of the combined gold and silver yield of the United States in the year 1880. These figures do not include the sums invested in burial grounds and expended in tombs and monuments, nor the loss from depreciation of property in the vicinity of cemeteries. For the rich, cremation would answer as well as burial, for the ceremonies connected with it could be made as costly and ostentatious as a Hindu sati. While for the poor, cremation would be better than burial, because so cheap so cheap until the poor got to imitating the rich, which they would do by and by. The adoption of cremation would relieve us of a muck of threadbare burial witticisms. But, on the other hand, it would resurrect a lot of mildewed old cremation jokes that have had a rest for 2,000 years. I have a colored acquaintance who earns his living by odd jobs and heavy manual labor. He never earns above $400 in a year, and as he has a wife and several young children, the closest scrimping is necessary to get him through to the end of the 12 months debtless. To such a man a funeral is a colossal financial disaster. While I was writing one of the preceding chapters, this man lost a little child. He walked the town over with a friend, trying to find a coffin that was within his means. He bought the very cheapest one he could find, plain wood, stained. It cost him $26. It would have cost less than four, probably, if it had been built to put something useful into. He and his family will feel that outlay a good many months.